Hello? Oh. Hello? Hello, mate, how are you? Not bad, thank you, buddy. How are you? Yeah, not too bad at all. How are you coping under, uh, under COVID? About as well as anybody could be, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, it's boring shit, isn't it? Oh, in it. Oh. Oh, fuck, you know. I cannot wait for it to be over, frankly. So where are you based? You've uh, been in cu- North Wales? Yeah, currently in North Wales, yeah. But originally from where Suffolk. About, where, where about? Oh, where am I from Suffolk? Uh, Woodbridge, like Ipswich. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, but you're in, where Where are you now in, in North Wales? Yeah, uh, Bangor. Oh, Bangor, yeah, yeah. Well, my, I've got, well, you used to have family in North Wales, but kind of like Abergelly way, a bit further around. Oh, yeah, kind yeah, yeah. Like, bit further, yeah, a bit further on. But I've got family in, uh, in Shropshire. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, it's just not, not a million miles from you. <laughs> ah, go figure, small world. But absolutely. So tell me about what you're doing. Well, um, I'm basically sort of putting together a sort of mini retrospective about um, about stuff that was sort of interesting to me growing up, you know. Um, yeah. And one of the things I wanted to talk about was Tunatic. Sort yeah. of as a, as a uh, well, as a fixture, really, for weekends. And um, talking more about sort of the behind the scenes stuff. And maybe right. it'll serve to sort of help people think about how they, they might want to make moves in the industry. Yeah, sure. Um, and I really, really appreciate you uh, taking time out. No, no, it. no worries. Look, there's no holds barred. Ask, ask me anything you want. I'm not, you won't offend me. You can ask me anything. Seriously. <laughs> well, I don't intend I'm, to offend you anyway. <laughs> I should stress. No, no, I'm not. I wasn't suggesting for one second. But I, you know, <laughs> having done many, many an interview and some of some big A-listers, you know, Hollywood A-listers in the past, you kind of sometimes tread on sensitive issues and they can be a bit funny. I don't care. So I, you can ask what you like. <laughs> okay. uh, fantastic. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, um, I, I have a little like sheet of questions, so forgive me if I'm just sort of looking, looking around or looking no, away. No, it's fine. I go for it. Um, so, what was it? How did you end up originally, sort of hosting Tunatic? Where were you at in your like career, and how did the show come to be? Well, after I got into television, which is a whole other story, um, just go forward three about three years, and I was working at GMTV, um, and I was producing uh, i'm trying to think how it, how it works well i was actually i was actually cutting the promos for um pokemon mm-hmm. we used to go out on our on our airspace so we, we came on i think it was either before i can't remember either just before or just after disney's dig it which then became digging it anyway we, we were kind of flatlining on the ratings and i said to my boss why don't we have a presenter red tape politics blah 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 so a couple of weeks later, I was only employed for a couple of weeks. He, the, the, the boss was off on holiday. So I said, look, while you're away, in this small department, keep me on. GMTV, you know, could quite easily afford me <laughs> at, at that time, of course. Um, and I'll come up with a, with a plan. And if you don't like it, call it development. If you don't like it, see you later. If you do, let's go from there. So while he was away, I um, got hold of, of the Pokemon tape, which was, it's, it's on, you know, uh, pre-recorded. So... We had to fill a, a specific amount of time, time and seconds. So if I cut scenes out of, let's just say it's 20 minutes long, if I cut a minute out of Pokemon, <clears throat> we, we've only got 19 minutes. That means you, the viewer, have got a one-minute black hole because it's not live. It's, it's literally on tape. Yeah. So whatever I remove, I have to replace. So I created a graphic. was set up on the roof. I made up some links, started spray-painting the, uh, the um, uh, roofs of the fire escapes out, outside where we were. Uh, with all these bright colours and the web address, and I just made everything up. And then, hi, welcome to Up on the Roof. Here's a letter from Dave, who's six from wherever it was. It was all made up. Mm. It was us in the office. Uh, here's Pokemon. 18, 19 minutes of Pokemon. Thanks very much. Don't forget we're doing this next week. See you later. Bye. So we had, we had, we now had a presence. So had me presenting and linking into it. <clears throat> but what the, the initial problem that I saw was that GMTV is a, you know, a morning show or was a morning show. So you wouldn't naturally, you'd go, oh, did you see Digging It? Which is a Disney show. When he said Digging It, you automatically thought of the Disney cartoons. So I needed to create something where you went, did you see so-and-so? Because if you went, did you watch Pokemon on GMTV? It's, kids don't say that. It's not, it's not going to trip, you know, roll off the tongue. So I needed to make Pokemon synonymous with us. So I called it up on the roof because I shot it on the roof. And we started to gain traction. We were doing silly things. The, the kids at school would now say, did you see Up on the Roof? Oh, yeah, I loved it when Pikachu did so-and-so. So Pokemon got a second name. Pokemon was now referred to sometimes 
was up on the roof. Okay. And that, people started to watch. So that was a kind of like a subliminal mind trick I was trying to play, and it worked. That grew and grew and grew and grew. And we went from one cartoon eventually to three cartoons, and we split those in half, and it gave us 12 links. So we went from a 20-minute no-link show to an hour and a half, three cartoon, 12-link show. Then, five years later, things were getting a bit touchy with Disney, who are one of our shareholders. And um, my boss, the big boss, uh, director of programs, came to me and said, can you do the entire weekend? Because I'd, I'd have to suddenly kick, produce this thing because we had this, uh, this issue with, with Disney. So I said, I can, but I can't do it regularly without the resources. So he said, write me a plan. So uh, my boss, a friend of mine I work with and myself, we came up with the idea of Tunatic. And we came up with a plan and wrote that. And it took us nine months to, to create, uh, pitched it. They liked it. Boom, and off, off we went. And that was how Tunatic was born. Tunatic was born out of, um, out of Up on the Roof. Because what was happening was Up on the Roof ratings were getting higher. Mm -hmm. Disney's were getting lower. But Disney were getting paid about two million quid more than we were. So they were saying, why are we paying all this money to Disney when actually we could do it in-house and A, save money and B, make more because the ratings are better. Mm. so that's that's how it happened so basically up on the roof is to blame <laughs> <laughs> uh that's really interesting to be fair it's sort of like building the proof of concept initially and then yeah. developing it further that's that's interesting thank you um what are your what are your fondest memories from doing tunatic oh blimey <laughs> it's <laughs> a big question isn't it yeah <laughs> yeah there's oh, it's five years there's still, I mean, yeah, some really good i mean the kids that came on most of the kids well, all the kids were great some were, were were better than others um but they had the chance to come on more often so they were kind of they walk in and it was almost like home so some of the some of the kids i worked with were were the highlight they, they were brilliant um there was one of the games we played where we had a um there's a photograph of it somewhere on or, you know you should google my name it, it appears but there's a kid, uh, it was boys versus girls, obviously, and it was a big, kind of like an Ikea tub, full of, literally full of custard. And in the custard, it was a, probably about eight, nine inches deep, two foot long, it was massive. And um, the kids had to put the like apple bob in, just stick the reds and get it. But this one kid couldn't reach, so I picked him up, and I'm literally dunking this kid. <laughs> he, he was totally submerged. I mean, heads <laughs> To his shoulders in, in custard. I don't know if you'd be able to do it now, but it was just th things like that. that we used to, I used to, and I used to push the boundaries. If I was told I couldn't do something, I'd, well, I'd ask, I said, look, can we do show and say, I'm not quite sure. If you weren't quite sure, I'd do it. Okay. It was a, because because that's, that's the only way to, to move things forward. Mm. Um, and there was one cartoon called Chop Socky Chooks. And I, I couldn't stand it. I never once, I think we ran it for about a year, I never never once called it Chop Socky Chooks. I think I called it Ching Changly Bonks. And when I when I did to begin with, we had to cut tape because um, we had to make sure that what I'd said um, didn't offend because I'd said Ching Chang. If I'd have said Ching Chang Chong, that mm. would have been um, um, kind of frowned upon. Um because I was worried it was going to offend the Chinese community. I wasn't even thinking Chinese, Japanese, Asian community. It was, you know, chop socky chooks. And it, these are martial art um, chickens. <laughs> and they had bling on. And it was just, I, it, I was just making things wrong. Ching changi bonks. That was it. And we got, and it was fine. Not got away. It was fine. It's not racist. And there was, there was no issue. But people come like, oh, you've got to be careful. It's just like, look, you're, you're making this. You're making this an issue. You're making this racist. You know, no one's no one's thinking these things. Just it's kids speaking the playground. Do you see Ching Changi Bonks? Oh yeah, the chickens did so and so. That's what they they're, they're thinking. And it was a way of trying to implant something silly into their head that brought them back to watch the show. Mm -hmm. So it was always about it was always about the cartoon and the kids. Yeah, it's sort of like getting Tunatic essentially synonymous with these shows and 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 yeah. weekend mornings. Yeah. Yeah, and things like cat sprays, we had this kind of, um, what's it called, um, Lazy Susan, he span at the end, as you remember. You yeah. Know? And it's so because of the, the, the word tune, tune on Tunatic stuck out, I used to go, mind your knees! <laughs> and we did that. And the amount of times I've been in the supermarket and a mum's come around the corner with a trolley going, oh, mind your knees! <laughs> All that kind of stuff. <laughs> and the games, so, so I would create, 
people say I would create, there, there would be there would be a game that we were playing or something that was going on, and um, I would try and work out a catchphrase or something for that while while we ran that item. So it would it would be repeated in the playgrounds, and it was constantly. I mean, kids would come up and repeat. I can't remember what they all now, but the, you know, the different catchphrases that we had mm. when I walk into a school or a or a um, university or whatever. So it worked, and it worked. It was the highest rated children's commercial weekend show at one point yeah i read that yeah which i mean yeah, well so deserved frankly um is there anything that you would say again it, it took a bit of time to get there <laughs> <laughs> worth the wait um is there anything that you would do differently if you could go back and do it all again from the start do differently um no i don't think i would you know you, you learn from your mistakes and that's that's how you, that's how how you get better it's mm. like you, you know if you're going to be in a uh, I don't know, for me for example do a lot of martial arts you, you need to be beaten to understand where you're going wrong uh, and what to, what to improve upon you know that's why you run tests you have a math test and you get 80 percent. so right there's 20 percent worth of improvement to be, to be done there so no i wouldn't i wouldn't do anything anything differently um I'm, it's, well, well, now, 2021 i mean it's been 11 years since we came off air mm. So trying to go back and remember some of the things that, that happened. I mean, some of the cartoons I probably wouldn't have had, but that wasn't my job. And that's just my opinion. And the guy that, that, that brought those in is one of my closest friends. So I'm going to say, Brian, if you see this, I'm not having a go, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Chop, socky, chirps, what were you thinking? <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I might, the only thing I might have changed would, would have been some of the animation. But again, that, that that's all dependent on... The other deals that are going on, what you're going to run it on, which other other platform, other stations, the platforms we've got, what the merchandise deals are, cost of the animation with everything else going on. You know, there's a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes that we're not privy to. Yeah. Okay. Um, what was the hardest part of doing Tunatic? The hardest part. Um, sometimes. Making the, the producers that we have, nothing, this is a tricky one because whatever, I don't want it to sound like Anna and I saved everything because because we didn't. We had some great producers, um, and the producers would write um, a script, and sometimes the the comedy in there works great on paper, but doesn't in in reality, mm -hmm. or you don't get the same effect. It's, it's still funny, it still works. So I would look at something. I, re I was really conscious of the fact that sometimes things got a bit cheesy or could get cheesy. And that used to, I didn't, it, it made me feel funny when I was presenting. So I would, I would go through it and try and work out ways of making a good script or parts of a good script that I thought were cheesy, uncheesy. Okay. But that's not taking anything to the producers. I'm not saying the producers wrote cheesy scripts, didn't they? they wrote bloody brilliant scripts, which is why Tunatic was as good as it was. But, you know, sometimes a presenter has a day off or a cameraman has a day off or a script, you know, you might be struggling for an idea and go, well, this is the idea. How can we make this funny? So there was the bar. That was the bar that the, 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 the uh, producers had to write their scripts to. Anna's job and my job was to take that script and, and, and raise it. Mm -hmm. If we presented, you know, the script to the bar, then as far as I was concerned, we, we weren't doing our jobs properly. So okay. the hardest bit for me, I suppose, was just making sure that um, we could deliver the comedy that the producers wanted without me personally feeling cheesy. But that's a personal thing. Okay, interesting. Uh, and that, that wasn't. I'm sorry to interrupt you. That wasn't. No, no, no. That wasn't all the time. That was only only on on some things. But you know, most of it wasn't hard. It, it was you're a professional. You go in and you do it. It was just every now and again, those things would, would, would get at me. Yeah. Okay. You mentioned, um, obviously, that it was scripted, but it's it shot sort of to look as if it was live. How much of the show yeah. actually is scripted? How much of what happens in the show? 70-30-ish, um, something like that. So 70% so scripted and 30% sort of winging it. Yeah, because you, you, you've still got a time frame to stick to. Mm. So there'd be a, you know, the script was there, 12 links. But we would come off script the whole time, you know. So whatever it was, something would happen, or we'd react to something, or I'd go off on a limb, or Anna would go off on a limb, or I'd pull something out of my pocket and read something at camera that not the script. And I'd, I'd like hand over the mic and go, oh, Anna, I'm going to change this a bit, or I speak to a camera guy and go, get ready, I'm going to come in on the close up on this because I'm going to don't tell the director, all that kind of business. Okay. And they would just they would just run with it. Um, so yeah, those those were those were some good parts. <laughs> <laughs> the 
<laughs> that's that's what we used, we, we used to do. So we, we learn the scripts. No, we learn it in the morning. So it takes me about an hour, if that, to learn the scripts um, because you're conditioned to it. So we, we were very used to learning them. Uh, and then we, and, you, and the reason we could come off the scripts is because we knew it so well. Mm. So if something happened, we could diversify or go off there or, or something, you know, we, we, whatever it was, and then pull it back to link back into the cartoon. Okay. Uh, following on from that, as you mentioned, you sort of improv and um, they're sort of, should we say cheeky humour, sort of directed more at yeah, older yeah, yeah. people. I remember there was one um, on the final episode, they were talking about the postman and you mentioned he's bringing you P45. Um, That's right, yeah. yeah. Did you ever like overstep the line and get told off by the producers or the directors? Were you ever told, you, 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 gotta, you gotta move that back. We gotta do that again and you can't. No, the, direct, the directors were, so what, we get the script, Don't forget, I've been there five years. So myself and two other people, we, we employed the producers. So, you know, producers could tell me off all they liked. Um, sometimes I'd listen to them, you know, because sometimes I would, I would really push it. I'm like, come on, Jay, you can't do that. And I'm like, all right, fair enough. Kn- knuckles and, and wrist slaps kind of thing. Um, I'm just trying to, trying to think. You know, we'd, we'd, I, w- I would push it as much as I could mm-hmm. um, without being silly. I mean, I wasn't kind of maverick about it. But if people weren't sure, then I used to argue the fact, well, then a researcher should, should find out. That's why you're a researcher. That's what I used to have to do when I was a researcher. If someone wasn't sure about what the answer was or what the, what the findings were at a particular level, go and do the research, bring it in, and then the producer will discuss it. Now, if the producers haven't asked the researcher to do that, well, that's not my problem. Yeah, you, you do what you, know, you can I, with what you've got. Yeah, exactly. I think sometimes that, that might have pissed some of the producers off a couple of times um but i never played it safe so if you're a producer and if you if, you, if all the producers written that show that it's very personal to you it's your baby so you think someone like me come along going now you can do so and so and i'll flip it you know and it grates i can understand why they got cross mm-hmm. but the whole mm-hmm. idea was to push this forward i didn't want to be the bbc or channel five or anybody else i wanted to be itv i wanted to be you know, commercial, when that's some fun, it was shiny floor. It's a very different feel to it. Um, if you want to be safe, go somewhere else. Mm. Okay. Was my, was my thinking. Some will agree with that, some won't, but, you know, yeah, that's probably why well, they're still working and I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> what is um, a, an interesting thing about, about Tunatic as a whole that most people probably wouldn't know? Like a story sorry, or... Broke or... Up to that again. Sorry. Uh, what What's an interesting thing about the show, like maybe a story about filming or or, or about the process that most people probably wouldn't know? Bloody hell, that's a good question. Um, the, the, the two big ones that happened made the, made national news. Um, so that's not really something they, they wouldn't know. But the biggest thing, I suppose, is people thought it was live. Mm. And it was. We shot it on a... Um, a Wednesday and a Thursday. We, we shot it as live, so we go on onto the floor. We shoot the take, and if it if it went wrong, it went wrong. Because if it was live, that's what you'd get. Very occasionally, will we do a second second take? Usually, um, I remember as a, as a great director uh, called Simon. And I can remember doing this particular link, and it was like after you finished speaking. And apparently, I was going. Mm. And he went, you're right, Jamie. And I went, yeah. So he said, what's wrong? And I went, oh, I can do that better than that. And my timing was wrong. She so will do it again. So I can I can re-deliver it. So a lot, a lot of the directors, would, or a couple of directors, would, would wait. Because I tried to put an ad-lib in all the time, where we could. If Apparently, if my face was going, mm, they'd ask if I wanted to reshoot it. <laughs> but um, that was it, really. No, no this, 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 yeah, we turn up, we do the job, and, and off we go. It was nothing, nothing major. No, fair enough. Um, no, let's no, talk- no, 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 no big secrets. <laughs> fair enough. Let's talk about the two things that you uh, you brought up that made the uh, the newspaper. Let's start with the, uh, the the infamous one. Uh, you were stopped by police, as I understand it. <laughs> yeah, well, I always forget the name of the cartoon we were doing. Uh, Dork Hunters, that was it. Like Ghostbusters, that that kind of thing. So in all, and it was it wasn't rating brilliantly well. We wanted to make it higher. So we did this thing where Anna and I would run out on the streets and we'd be chasing dogs and then we'd pull out a hairdryer and we'd shoot this thing and we'd put all the graphics on in, in, in the edit <clears throat> and we'd suck these 
dorks, these alien things, and then we get, we get points. And we got stopped by this um, female, uh, WPC rather, and who are you, what are you doing? Show the permit, fine, not to worry. And then just as we were about to carry on filming, another policeman came over. He was obviously trying to, you know, ruffle his feathers and, and prove to the woman he was the big man. And started getting really facetious. I mean, we've just been through this with, with your... With your uh, with your colleagues she's asked all the questions she's happy you're actually undermining her um and whilst he was going on oh, we're going to hold you here under section whatever it was at the time 44 the anti-terrorism act because we had all these things on us i said you're joking I, and i said to the one of the, i said keep filming just, just film all of this <laughs> so they filmed it and as we, we you know this guy was checking us out with control the uh, half term a bunch of kids came past all right jamie all right Anna. i went there yeah, see look, they, they know all this kind of, three of them came over for an autograph Whilst this guy is still detaining us, <laughs> so it was just it was just farcical. Um, and then um, he said, "I well, uh, gave my statement, and he, he wrote it all down, signed that, and I read it." And I said, "No, I'm not signing it." So I, he said, well, "Why not?" So I said, "Because you haven't written what I've said." I said, well, "All right, we have these kind of um, uh, knife-proof jacket-looking things on. They weren't the real ones, covered in Velcro, and I had planes and sweets and all kinds of you know crap hanging off it." But why he, he got funny is because we had a hair dryer. Mine was blue, and obviously Anna's was pink. Mm -hmm. where, where where your gun would be, and that was our, our weapon of choice. So I said, I told the only reason you stopped me is because I've got this blue spangly hair dryer. Yeah, right. So I said, you write down that you, you just the reason you stopped me, or us, is because I was wearing a blue spangly hair dryer, and I'll sign it. <laughs> he said, I'm not, I'm not writing it. I said, I'm not signing it then. Put down. What it's about. Eventually, he changed it, and, he, and I read it through. <laughs> I'm just saying, Mr. Rick, as a Swiss blow for wearing a blue spangly hair dry while swimming on set. I went, oh, I'll sign that. I signed it. <laughs> you needed it on record that that was why you were stopped. It's it's on it's on record that I was stopped for carrying a blue spangly hair dryer. <laughs> it's the footage. If he'd been nice about if he'd been nice about it, I'd have signed it. It's because he was a facetious little prat. Yeah. And I just wanted I was just I was just being awkward. Just sort of winding him up <laughs> a little bit, which is fair yeah, enough, yeah. you know. Well, um, I just felt sorry for the WPC because she she was brilliant, you know. She checked everything properly, and it was all good. And then he, why I was pissed off is because he held us for twenty minutes, and we ain't got twenty minutes to film. You know, we're, we've got a lot of work to do. Mm. You know, and it was just like, oh come on, mate, we could have shot. And the weather was changing as well. It's like we've got to get this done. And if we don't, we, we can't shoot because this guy's been a prat. Yeah, quite a bit. <laughs> uh, you mentioned you told the uh, the crews to keep filming. Is there footage of this somewhere, or is that been... so, well? It, it was on the national news. It hit the 10 o'clock news. So, yeah, there is. I don't know what there still is or who got it. I know one person that might have a copy. I'll have to ask him. Um, <laughs> but I'm sure if you go at the uh, ITN uh, news archives, which is it's in there somewhere. <laughs> that's, that's that's really interesting, to be fair. Yeah. And uh, what, was, what was the second one you mentioned? We did a thing, a uh, sketch on the Emperor's New Clothes. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I supposedly walked out. This woman complained I, I was I'd walked out naked on the show and the children were visibly embarrassed. And it was like, okay, first of all, of course I didn't walk out naked in front of children. Yeah. What I actually did, what I actually did was walk out. I had a uh, box shorts on, like to the swimming shorts, um, then body stocking uh, uh, over that, so uh, skin color body stocking, um, no top, just normal top, so you can see the wire. And I had a board. Car, bit of car all, all painted up with the competition address held over me particulars but if I'd have pulled it away I was covered up it was, there was nothing there and then we shot me walking down and I'm waving and smiling at the kids or where the kids would be well, they were in the studio waving at them where, where they'd be then I was removed and put everything else back on again the kids were put in place and they were like pointing and actually there was a floor manager that was walking down they were pointing at the floor manager so you get a close-up or two-shot, then it cuts to a two-shot. So I was never in the studio at the same time as the kids when I walked down the thing, still covered. But she thought we'd done it so well that I'd actually just held this thing in front of my nuts and the children were embarrassed. And that hit that hit the news as well. I think we got page four in the sun. Obviously, my <laughs> boobs weren't big enough. <laughs> but it, it was just ridiculous. ridiculous. That's crazy. In a way, some woman from South End who said, "I, I choked, I, I, I choked on my corn, or my children choked on their cornflakes." So I was like, "Have you never taken them swimming?" Yeah, essentially, because you know I mean? it's just it's just topless, and as you say, you weren't in the same room as the kids. Yeah, exactly. I mean, in a way, it kind of is 
a, a, a testament to the show that it was edited so yeah. well that people thought that it was. <laughs> exactly. Um, and also, we don't mind that kind of press because we can have fun with it. It, it, it you know, hits, hits the, the tabloids, it's national news, and then we just come out and go, don't be bloody stupid. Yeah. <laughs> you know, of course, of course we didn't, you moron. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, we can make it work. We had a good press office. <laughs> <laughs> um, I noticed that after, well, sort of when Tunatic was wrapped up, you continued playing these sort of cheeky improv characters. In particular, uh, your Mandy profile states you played Buttons in Cinderella in a pantomime. When did you yeah. realise that that was kind of a skill set for you? When did you realise that was something you were suited to doing, these kind of cheeky well, improv comedy characters? It's always been my character. I've always been an extrovert. Um, and you know, just like making people laugh. And if you like it, watch it. If you don't like it, you know, I get, I get abused. I walk into McDonald's or wherever, and you get some a bunch of kids going, Oh, you're the bloke off the telly. Yeah, yeah, your show's crap. Well, you got Sky. Yeah. How many channels have you got? About 500. Well, watch one of them then. You know, if you don't like it, I just, I'm far too thick skinned to worry about what, you know, what, what people think. Um, if it's a, if, if you let the negativity get to you, you it, it affects you. So you just have to go, you know, whatever. But I, I, I grew up not far from the South End. So we go to Panto every every year, my grandparents. And I always wanted to be in pantomime. And then just characters, you know, as you grow up in plays you've done at school, it was, I always try and have some fun with the character at some point. So it wasn't that I suddenly had this epiphany. It's like, oh, I, I need to do so-and-so or have I got a talent for this? It was just something I just did naturally. And people would go, can you do this? So when I got an agent and said, you know, I want to be in Panto, he was like, right, well, you're going to be those kind of characters, buttons, wishy-washy, you know, all, all, all those kind of people. Mm. Um, Smee and Peter Pan. And, I, and I, I'm, the, I'm the kind of the, the comedy character. Usually, I mean, Buttons isn't, isn't in Cinderella in the real thing. Buttons is made up for Panto. Mm. And he's the one that, you know, all the he's, he's the kid's best friend. He's the one that goes and goes, Way! and I fall off stage and silly things happen and all that kind of business. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I've, I've, I've about 15 pantos now. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah, 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 definitely. What was it like being pied at the end of the show? Well, the first time I ever did it, we had a show with Fern Cotton, which I produced and co-presented with it. It was called Cotton on GMTV. So this was before the, the um, Up on the Roof really started. We were just kind of testing the water. And um, I just got a load of cream and the rest of it. So the first time I actually got properly custard pied or cream pied, it was um, proper whipped cream and double cream. And it stuck up my nose for oh, weeks. It was horrible. You could always taste it. What we used to use on Tunatic was some kind of non toxic as it were um shaving foam that's all that's all it was really to shave yeah. so it, it hit yeah they, i think they, they used to mix a few other bits in it so it, it covered your face a bit more but we had to do it they would literally make the pies right before we started the very last take because the studio lights would make it shrink it like you know squirty cream it would just evaporate yeah <laughs> so sometimes sometimes depending on who was making the pie we would get absolutely covered um <laughs> But it was it was fine. It was fine, and if it went up your nose, it ran out again, so it didn't smell. It was, it was okay. Okay, that's nifty. I, I mean, I mean you know, the worst one was when we were at Nickelodeon because we used to get covered in green slime. That was awful because on Tunatic, we'd, we'd come off the show and we'd kind of like strip strip off, as it were, stick your head in the in the sink, and we'd have our hair wash wash our hair in the in the makeup room. But in um, Nickelodeon, I mean, it was full on get changed, shower, and this stuff just well, oh, it's horrible. <laughs> <laughs> the green slime from Nickelodeon. Yeah. Oh, it's horrible. <laughs> How did you end up um, moving towards Nickelodeon? That's a that's quite an interesting. Well, we got side taken way. off there. And this, we, we, Anna and I were in. we about to do a show. It was, it was the March of it was March, two thousand and ten. Mm -hmm. uh, we were both sitting in makeup, and one of our producers came and saw us. Said we, we all needed up in the um, boardroom. So what we shot, and then three of the senior management came in and said basically. Um, GMTV has been bought out now totally by ITV. <clears throat> um, and they're giving the money to CITV Manchester. You're now out of a job. You got till May. So and that was it. Right before we went on air, it was like brilliant. We've got 12 weeks. So I came out of the meeting room, spoke to my agent, and said, "Call these people." And then went and presented the show. Um, then I had a couple of meetings with um, a guy, a guy called Peter Drake at, at Nickelodeon, and he asked him whether or not. Um, I had a production company that could make it. And I said, yes. 
And then I suggested that I brought some of the team from Toonatic and Anna to Nickelodeon. And then rather than pay me and the production fee on top of that, save the money and just produce it in-house, but mm. just em- employ them as staff. So that's what happened. A lot, a lot of us went across. And then we started there for, for two years at Nickelodeon. Fair enough. That's interesting, to be fair, how it was just sort of essentially just picking up where you left off, just with a different sort of company, almost. Well, yeah, because I just, I just, I just rang the big kids next kid, the big kids networks, and just said, "Look, Anna and I are going to be kids under your, under your hats. Anna and I are out of a job. Um, it's the highest rated commercial show. There's, there's a bit of PR and you know, and uh, commercial marketing here for you. you mm. you've, you've snapped us up, as it were, if, if you want us. Um, and they were, that, that sounds good. Yeah. What was it like for those last like three months after, as you said, you got told essentially your your time is is coming to an end? It was it was it was weird because when you when you're in the production meetings and then you're actually on set filming, it's it's like nothing's changed because you're just focused on what you're doing. It's, it's when you step out of that environment, you go, Christ, I'm on countdown now. And then um, they all said, "Oh, we're gonna get Rickers to cry on the last show." Now nah, you won't. It's fine. Be upset in the sad, but you know, blah blah blah. Anyway. I was fine for most of the show. And then I opened the door and all the kids came in and we weren't, it wasn't in the script. So we didn't know the kids were coming in and our regulars came on and I was just floods of tears. Like, oh no, I'm not going to work with these kids anymore. And then, <laughs> like, the going, yeah, we got him, we got him. So it was, yeah, that was, that was, that was very sad. We got a lot of complaints actually. People say now, oh, oh you, you know, you've left ITV to go to Nickelodeon. It's all about the money. It's like, well, actually the money was the same. And it wasn't a question of ditching one and going to the other because think ITV is a is a big network. Mm. You wouldn't you wouldn't choose to leave ITV in a, in, in a kids environment and, and go to <clears throat> go to a, a, um, a smaller rated channel, as it were. Um, but we had no choice. You know, I got a mortgage and kids to feed. I had to find work. And when they said that's it, May the twelfth or whatever it is will be your last show. I'm like, what? <laughs> Christ! Yeah, I've got I've got to find something. Yeah, no but it choice. wasn't our. We still be doing it now. It wasn't. It wasn't our choice to leave at all. We just they literally said, "See ya, thanks, you're off," and that was it. Mm. No, no loyalty, which is a shame, really. And yeah. especially after you know the five years of work that you and the team put into it, I can imagine it just felt yeah, like, yeah, a, it was like kicking the teeth. Yeah, yeah. Uh, on a more broad note, what was your yeah. favorite show that you worked on? When I was in production, uh, yeah, or as a host, or any generally, what was what oh, was? See, oh, me. The one I had a load of fun on was a show called Prove It. I remember Prove which It, which is like, yeah, me and Michael Joe challenged, and we got on like a house on fire. We had, we had a lot of fun on that show <clears throat> in the studio on location. We did some crazy things, you know, swimming with sharks and bungee jumps and rally cars and all kinds of stupid stuff it, that was that was great and, that, and being just a host on those kind of things was, was great fun um in production oh so many because they, they all come with their own experiences so i did a show with a guy called um i'm just trying to think of the, the, the two main the two main shows it's, it's when i was researching mm-hmm. i was actually a runner john morgan is the guy's name and um I worked, I worked with him as a runner and the internet wasn't, you know, what it is today. So not many machines were in the building. So not everybody had connection to the internet <clears throat> in certain departments, but I would be in at seven in the morning. And when everybody's finished, I'm finished doing my running duty. So I'd see John and I'd say, look, give me something to do. What, what else can I do? Cause he was always there well into to the late hours. Um, and it was a show called Goggle Watch. I think it was called, it was a kid's, six part comedy that kind of thing and we shot it in france and we shot it in the studios in manchester um and i worked really long hours and that's kind of self self-made as it were and um, so I, I really wanted to learn uh, and john was brilliant with me and at the end of it we, we had the, the first show in the, in the office and when the credits came up because the first show I'd, I'd had a credit on and i was waiting for my name to come up you know runner jamie rickers and it came up researcher and I shot round my head to the left and John saw me and, and smiled. So I didn't say anything. I waited until everybody comes in. And I said, you just give me a researcher's credit. And he said, he said, absolutely. He said, you'll never be a runner again. And I was like, I've only been here six months and I'm, I'm already researching properly, as it were. Um, 
he was brilliant. He taught me a lot. And he, old old school TV, so standards, disciplines, protocols, all that kind of stuff that you had mm. to adhere to. All the all the real proper basics that sometimes you, um, are missing. But John was awesome. Um, I think that's why I used to like pushing it a bit. I, I look at what he'd done, remember those kind of things and, and things he'd said to me, and provide the foundations in place, and you're not being deliberately offensive, or, and, and you're not. Break, breaking, you know, on off club regulations, it were. Then push it, try and enhance it. But unfortunately, not not many John Morgans around these days. Uh, alas. alas um, yeah. So uh, tell me more about the business behind making these kids' TV shows, particularly sort of like pitching to networks, working with them, the 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 the, 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 the business or politics behind the fun that you see on TV. Uh, well, when we did, to, you have to remember, GMTV was the network as well. So mm. we owned six till nine twenty-five. ITV was nine twenty-five till six the following morning. ITV owned seventy-five percent of GMTV, and the other twenty-five percent was owned by Disney. So that that three and a half hours, GMT wasn't just the show; it was actually the network, which is why when Disney sold the remaining shares, and we were told you got no job anymore, GMTV was swallowed up in, in its entirety into into ITV. So the ITV then became that 24 hour network, but that's, that's the politics. Hmm. Um, so we, it's, it's your research. It's looking at what's speaking with the sales guys and, and acquisitions and finding out what's popular, what's going to be going to, going to be big, what the new trends are, what the toys are, what cartoons related to those, how we can then write a show based around that. Will there be comedy characters? What are the graphics going to look like? Who's going to get to do the music? What's the title sequence going to look like? How much staff do we want? You know, are we going to need a bigger premises? Yes. Do we get studio time? How many cameras? Are, are we going to have to do OB stuff? Can we then do partnerships or affiliation with somebody else? All of that and much, much more. And you sit and you plot it out and you work it all out. And then you write the script for the timing to build that into the program, see how it's going to work. Um, it's a lot of work. So, you know, and then we didn't need to go to a network and pitch it because we were already on. It was, it was, we were there, you know, it was our network. Yeah. Um, so that, that bit wasn't an issue. Going to, The only pitching I did was when we go to set designers or musicians <clears throat> and say, this, this is what we've got, this is the kind of feel we're looking for, give them all the information. And then, um, well, it wasn't really a pitch, it was an explanation, and they would then come and pitch their ideas to us, their, their graphic sequence, their title music, or, what, or their sets. Um, so we were, we were on, the, on the other side of it, as it were. Okay. But it's like any business, you've got to look at what it's going to cost, how much you think it's going to make, and where you can spend that budget. And mm. then when you've got that, what can you afford to do with it? Okay, that's cool. Uh, sorry, just a heads up, because I don't actually pay for Zoom. If it suddenly just cuts off, it's probably because we've hit oh, the 40 minute link. I, I'm not being no rude, worries. I promise. Um, yeah, no, it's fine. <laughs> but you mentioned the business, and uh, obviously you've moved on from, from that sort of stuff. And currently, you're yeah. a consultant at uh, Velopa. I was, yeah. So I, I went from that Nickelodeon finished, then went and did, did that late night roulette stuff just to keep the money coming in. Mm-hmm. And whilst I was doing that, I was working. It's a long story, but met these guys several several years ago now, um, and I was introducing clients to them for bank to bank and money exchange. And eventually, they said, they "Actually, got some clients in some big areas. Do you want a full time job?" TV was kind of not really where I wanted to be anymore. Um, well, I did want to be there, but reality, take, reality TV had kind of taken over. And I didn't want to be a part of reality TV. So I kind of like changed the location. Um, was with them for a few years. And then I resigned just, just before COVID. I resigned just at the wrong time. Um, so last year was, was a tricky one. Yeah. Would that, you... that's the... Sorry. No, no, no. You go. You go. No, no. But that's, that's where I am now, I was going to say. Okay, fair. Would you ever consider going back to performing? Not even necessarily just children's stuff. Would you consider acting? Would you consider more like narrative short stuff like that? Yeah, absolutely. I, mean, I still, I still love doing that, and I love the buzz of being on on stage with a live audience. It's it's not for anything, not for any any um, vanity kind of purposes. Because if it goes wrong, you've only got yourself to blame. So you know, mm. you put yourself out there. You've got to take the the highs and and the lows. But it's a different kind of adrenaline buzz. It's, you haven't got the you haven't got the opportunity to do it again. If it goes wrong, you know, a, a, a theatre full of people see you cock it up, but there's nowhere to run. 
and in a massive theatre when you get it wrong, and I've got it wrong many times. I feel about that big. You're like, oh, God. There's literally nowhere to go. The amount of gags I've cocked up on stage, I'm going, oh, shit, this is really embarrassing. <laughs> you have to keep going. So that for me, it's, it's, I like doing that because you have to work harder. You have to push yourself, mm. you know, because you, you haven't got that, that bigger margin for error. So would you maybe prefer doing that more so than acting in, say, short films or, or a TV series that's more scripted, for example? No, either either. either either. Um, it's not really something I've, I've, I've pursued. I think mm. you'd need to start again. And um, I was really doing other bits and pieces, but I'd never rule it out. And it's something I'm doing at the moment or trying to help develop at the moment where if we get there, those opportunities will, will arise if we take it down that path. But there's, there's no reason why we couldn't. Okay. Well, I'll send you one of my scripts. Um, is no, there... I do, absolutely. <laughs> uh, is there anything you want to say or promote to anyone who's uh, watching? Um, no. No. <laughs> no. I, just, I think I, no. I mean, I'm quite happy with with, with what I'm doing. Um, obviously, TV work is was something I've wanted to do for for years, and 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 did you know at the highest level in the field that we were in. Yeah, so uh, James Grant, if you're watching, that's the, a big management company. Come on, snap me up. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll have some of you guys. I've tried before. But no, I'm, I'm, I'm good. You know, I, I would just say to people at the moment, even though you were in this kind of weird position of COVID and lockdown, mm. you know, the world, it, we will get out of it. The world will go on. And you shouldn't, nobody who's starting out should let this um, kind of dampen their, their dreams. They should still put their head down and pretend it's not happening and push for what you want. Because okay. someone has got to do it. I was, I was always said, well, people from where you, you're from, tiny little village, excuse me, well, won't, don't get in TV, don't become famous, don't work on, you know, presenters. Mm. And I was always like, well, it's not the fame I'm after. It just, it's just, it looks fun. You know, I watched Philip Schofield and Andy Peters and I wanted that job. And why can't it be? They've got to come from somewhere. Yeah. So, you know. And the second that everybody else went, oh, yeah, you're right. Brilliant. That's less competition for me. <laughs> so if you want to do it you want to present you want to produce direct whatever it is just keep pushing that's awesome that's a great note thank you thank you very much for your time jamie um it's been a pleasure, pleasure. and then um just let me know when and what this goes out on and the rest of it yes i shall do thank you um i'll edit yeah, yeah, yeah. sort of it together in a more structured thing but i might put this up sort of as a whole separate thing but um yeah that's brilliant thank you very much for your time uh pleasure it's been really interesting thank you Absolutely. Any, you know, if you need anything else, you've got my number, give us a call. I do. Thank you very much, mate. Thank you. Lovely. Take care, buddy. Thanks a lot, Lewis. Take care, buddy. See Cheers. you, mate. Bye. Bye. Bye.